All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Justin. I am the founder of PayDevitas.com, and I am today joined by Mr. Nice Guy, Professor Charlie, the billion dollar ads man and founder at Disruptor School. Charlie, how are you? I am doing lovely, man. It's a beautiful day in paradise over here in LA. How's Canada Love treating it. you? It's good, man. It's doing, I mean, it's it's better. I'd say we've got some suns. The windows are open. I've even found a cricket on oh. my window today, which is a very good sign of spring. So I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> I like that. Interesting. Uh, you know what? I found a cricket in my office last week too. All right, we're there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, coming from a guy that had like 10 centimeters of snow last week, I take cool. that as a win, honestly, on my side. Yeah. So, no, it's good. But uh, yeah, thanks for uh, reaching out on Discord. I mean, we've been uh, chatting back and forth through various group chats. You've also been on the channel a while back, I think about a year ago, or maybe even more at this point. And uh, probably a lot has happened on both of our ends since. Give us a quick rundown of where are you at now with Disruptor School? How have things evolved? And uh, just, yeah, catch us up to uh, where you're at. Yeah. Um, so over the last year, Disruptor School grew by about 200%. Um, yeah. My take home on that was a little over a million. And we had $7,000 in refunds, primarily from like subscriptions and whatnot overrunning. But we've had, I think, an extra 150 people join the MBA program. Nobody's ever cool. asked for their money back. So that's good expanded the team, growing things. Now I've got my fingers in a couple other brands. And um, I mean, it's just it's just going by leaps and bounds. You know, we're at the spot now where we've got guest speakers every other week and the master classes continue to grow. And it's just, it's been incredible. And one of the things I think that makes me so happy more than anything is the amount of people that reach out to me and say that they now have confidence, they're making more money, they're saving time, and everything makes sense. Mm -hmm. And in a world where vanity metrics and salesmanship can get a lot of people into a situation that puts their dreams at risk, to be a place where they can go and a person they can trust to help them provide for their family and opportunities for their community is everything so all in all cannot complain love it and i've been trying to give credit where credit is due i mean i you i know you've commented on some of my videos you've seen that our discussions you know last year have been quite impactful i've wholeheartedly adopted the going broad club and 322 methods and uh, pretty much all of our accounts have been transitioned to that we've also saved a tremendous amount of time and uh i think there's very sound reasoning back in this up i've tried many times to to, to put this new structure that you've introduced to me towards to, to the test, right? To against lookalikes, against the traditional top mop buff and everything. And it's always outperformed it by a mile in the long run. So uh, yeah, I guess I'm part of that same club having to thank you, you know, publicly for that. Uh, well, well, thanks, man. I mean, I, yeah, I see the content that goes out there and, and, and I appreciate it. And that's why I was, I saw the last one you did and I was like, dude, let's have a chat. Like, <laughs> any questions anybody's got anything you want to know like anybody evangelizing like I, i'm all for it and, and Love it. i hope that that you know i'm not sitting here trying to take i don't want to take credit as like the reason that things happen i just want like i've been talking about this for years and i've been teaching it for years and anything i can do to get more people to adopt it because as soon as they do like the world opens up and there's just mm -hmm as much joy as I can bring people like that's, that's the whole motivation. And so like, I just love folks that can also more articulately than me or with better guidelines and graphics and like uh, <laughs> educational resources. I, I mean, like, it's great. I love it. I, I think I saw in your, one of your videos, there was like this uh, diagram of everything. And I was like, dude, mm -hmm. I need to have that. Like you've explained <laughs> what I teach better in like a snapshot than a ways that I've been able to communicate for years. And for those things, just like the least I could do is be like, how else can I help? Love it. And I think one, one of the ways I can, I, I, I can already uh, ask you, I guess, for that help is to answer some of the comments I, I get very often under these videos, right? Where I think the most common one I get is, uh, would this work because I have a very specific audience? So it's like, Oh, I only work with, let's say B2B, um, 
uh, landscapers, you know, in the States that's whatever they sell, uh, equipment or would this work for me, I guess. So what do you answer to these people? Yeah. Generally speaking, universally, the answer is yes, but more than just saying that, let me qualify it. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to give you like broad targeting and dynamic, creative three, two, two, all of that stuff is not a hack. It's showing you how the software was written. Let me give mm -hmm. you an analogy. If you're trying to do pivot tables on Excel, it doesn't matter if you're grading your kids' homework, if you're trying to figure out like the equation to some very mm -hmm. elaborate math problem, or you're doing the finances for a nine-figure business. Like it doesn't matter. It's a pivot table. It functions the same way for everybody. If you're playing Grand Theft Auto, it works the same for everybody. Like software is coded, which means the experience is identical which means that the way you're supposed to use it is the same. Now, the application of that might be different, right? The kind of ads that you're running or the business objective that you're promoting, there's wild variety in there, of course. But showing somebody this is how a piece of software was designed to be used. Another analogy I could give is like, you can use a screwdriver to hammer in nails. It'll work but why not just use a hammer? And, and so mm. I'm just trying to teach people, these are the simple, basic building blocks of how the software was written so they can understand how to apply that knowledge for what's best for them. And at the core of that, Facebook has the business model of showing people content that they want to see. If you see content you don't like, odds are you'll use a different platform, right? Like one of the reasons that TikTok blew up is because it had a better experience than what Instagram was providing. Mm -hmm. And Instagram immediately grabbed the reels and they did the same thing with stories, with Snapchat. And the point is Facebook is always trying to give you the best experience so that you come back more often and spend more time on the platform. And why that's important is because your ads are nothing more than just organic content that you pay to show to people. And they might also have, you know, some CTAs and some buttons on them, which is what organic content might not have. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a question of, will this work for me? It's a question of, can I create content that my ideal user wants to see? And more importantly, we have to understand that ultimately Facebook's business model allows advertisers to monetize attention. And really, every business is a, a business model itself is a repeatable system to turn attention into money. And what makes a good business versus a bad business is one that can do so at a profit. And businesses that grow can do that in a way that secures future cash flow. And so ultimately, it's not a can I make Facebook ads work because I've got the right targeting and the right hack or the right bid or any of that stuff? It's, can I make content that attracts the right type of attention for the way that my business converts that into money? And ultimately, I'm going to be very successful if I can turn that into future cash flow at a profit. And at that mm. point, it's the exact same thing as a carnival barker. It's the exact same thing as a... As a billboard, uh, I mean, I always said, you know, Facebook ads are often like billboards. They obfuscate your like view of the sunset, right? Like you're not on Facebook or Instagram to see the ads. It's something that gets mm -hmm. in the way. But if it gets in the way and makes somebody's experience better than somebody else that gets in the way, or even if it's actually just good, you're going to be seen by more people. And not only are you going to be seen by more people, but the quality of the person that you reach is going to be better and the cost to reach them is gonna be lower. And I'll end with this. Back in the day, I was running New Balance. Like I wasn't CEO of New Balance. There's a lot of people on Twitter that make a lot of claims. I was not the CEO of New Balance. I was running their Facebook ads. Yeah. And it was at the very beginning of advanced matching, which is the brain behind broad targeting. By the way, if you don't have advanced matching turned on, go and turn it on. If you're paying somebody to run their ads and they haven't turned it on, find somebody that cares about you and fire that agency like <laughs> immediately. Um, because this is like day one level stuff. Uh, anyway, what we found 
Yeah. And in very specific use cases, we had an ad of a red pair of trainers. Mm. And we're spending New Balance money, right? Like, it's not, you know, it's not Nike. It's not like McDonald's, but it's not small. Mm. And what we found was two-thirds of our budget, where it was New Balance's first impression talking to somebody, yeah, was on somebody that had abandoned cart on a pair of red trainers from Adidas, Puma, Nike, Reebok, and I think Converse. Mm -hmm. And the point is, Facebook saw that they went to that landing page. They selected that color. There was metadata in the description of the product. And they didn't buy. And they went to somewhere else and they added to cart. And so Facebook's saying, hey, you're in market for this. You want to see this. We've actually got content that other people that are looking for this enjoy. Here you go. We're making your experience better. And as a result, we made a lot of money. And that's really all that it is. Just like yeah. your Instagram reel or TikTok, you might have 100 followers, but you can get a million views. It's because people want to see it. Yep. There's no difference. So all we're doing is basically saying, how do we avoid paying extra to make that more difficult. Let's just let the machine do its job and then rely on ourselves to make sure that when we meet Facebook's business objectives, we're also meeting our own. Interesting. And one thing you, you said in the in one of the videos on there, which you commented recently, um, I had made this diagram from something you mentioned in our previous episode, which I believe there were uh, two circles, or I don't know if that was a specific video, but there are two circles, one of which you told me, you need to choose like a core competency, you're either going to choose search, email, uh, uh, social, or there was another one that you had said to choose, which I can't remember right now. And then you said on the other one, you have nuances, you have consumer psychology, storytelling, you have econometrician, and you have operations. Mm -hmm. Which of these nuances would you say you have adopted and teach at Disruptor School? You know, that's a, that's a great point. I, I love that. Um, so to kind of give some color, what I say is, generally speaking, the most successful businesses are good at like three things. Uh, and it doesn't matter what those three things are. It might be affiliate, might be email, might be social, might be search, might be CRO, might be customer service, whatever it is. And what makes media buyers or any operators really successful is to take some of these commodity skills of copywriting and media buying. And those are all things that are of value, but basically anybody can do it. And anybody that can do it, there's somebody else that will do it and work harder for you than less money. There's somebody willing to grind more than you. What makes you valuable, and I call it as being able to provide undeniable value, is being able to combine that commodity skill with a expertise level and a nuance, right? So in disruptor school, what we really try to focus on is letting you, giving you more information on how to use the tools so that whatever your strength is, there's an opportunity. Now, my DNA mm. is way more in the econometrician, meaning I'm looking at numbers. I'm looking at math. I'm looking at money. I'm looking at how do I look at data? And full disclosure, one of the things I'm terrible at is creative. I'm a terrible copywriter. I'm like the worst on Canva. I have no way to attract, like, put me on camera and I'll, I'll be fine. Put me in a room and I'll be good. But like, figure out a way to like, get somebody's attention without that, I'm screwed. <laughs> so it, there is a core functionality and ultimately saying, what is your strength? If your strength is creative, we've got all the assets to help you get better at the economics and the math and the data and on the operations. If your strength yeah. is in the operations, you're like, look, I can get people to do work. I can organize folks. I can understand how to get stuff done. We can help you understand how to lift the people on your team that are the creative or the finance or the data folks. And so the point is that my own strengths combined with all of the guest speakers that we bring on really tries to round out everything. And so far, like even this year, we've had, you know, we, we, one of our most popular masterclasses was Sarah Levenger talking about consumer psychology and creative design. Mm -hmm. We've had Chase uh, Mosani from heatmap.com, which is like the best CRO tool anybody could ever have. Talk about like improving the revenue per session. And, and I love mm -hmm. Dylan, the, the co-founder of uh, heatmap.com he looks at conversion rate optimization just like ROAS is a complete trash metric and, and so we're, we're buddies around that uh <laughs> we, just today we had Jordan West talking about TikTok shops and 
we've had Noah uh, from Snowball, uh, Social Snowball come in and teach that. And we're going to have Dara come in soon. And the, the idea is I'm trying to bring in singular levels of expert of expertise, platform level, executional level, institutional knowledge to help round out everywhere that you are strong, we've got the ways to operationalize it. And everywhere yep. you are weak, we can give you the tools to level up your team members who are better than you at it so that everybody can basically be at baseline. And that's that's really the focus is it's not a how to do this one thing well. Because honestly, yes. like how to do Facebook ads well is a two week, three week training. Like I, I say all the time, um, to become like a world-class chef at Pizza Hut takes like two weeks. Facebook ads is mildly more complicated than that, but not really. Anybody with a couple of weeks can basically be as good as somebody with a couple of years. What makes mm. you valuable is the ability to do that commodity skill and pair that with that nuanced um, institutional knowledge and expertise. And that's really where we try to make the commodity skill entry level for anybody and then provide those resources to help you in those nuances so that if it's your skill, nice. you've got somebody to help you level up. And if it's not your skill, it becomes a thing that you can give an entry-level employee to level up the entire business. Okay. And talking about that, right, what do you work out or how do you work out attribution? Like what numbers do you look at to define ad effectiveness given that you don't look at, at ROAS, given that's this metric that, you know, you, you call vanity. So many agencies and marketers and brand owners just solely decide whether or not they're going to invest more money into meta by looking at that one metric. So you as an econometrician, what metrics stand out to you in that case? Yeah. Um, I mean, so I think the best way for me to explain this is I think there are really three equations that permeate the, the marketing space. One is ROAS, which is a performance marketer equation. I spent this money today based on attribution. I deserve credit for X amount of sales today. And to be fair, I think we're all more or less fully aware on how that can be completely gamed and manipulated. Yeah. Like you want the world's best ROAS? Show ads to people that opened an email on a buy one, get one free or 75% off sale. Your ROAS would be like 30. Will you make any extra money? Yeah. Probably not. Um, so that number is very low integrity because not only is it kind of illegitimate, but the actionability of that data is basically null. I have a ROAS of three. Awesome. What are you going to do? Yeah. Well, now you've just opened yourself up to a bunch of other questions, basically meaning that that original data point has no value. A lot of folks have turned to another metric, and I think the person that made it really popular is Alex Hermosi. And to be fair, Alex isn't wrong. His target audience is somebody that is more entry level than maybe somebody I talk to. But mm -hmm. his metric that he made very popular was LTV and CAC. Yep. What is the lifetime value? How much does it cost to acquire a customer? Yep. One of the extremely important nuances to that equation when it comes from Alex is that Alex is often talking about when he's referencing that getting he's referencing gym launch right mm -hmm. how much does it cost to get a gym member and what is the lifetime value of that member that gym membership comes with reoccurring purchases and there's no yep. additional advertising cost to get to that LTV that LTV cost of continuing to get those additional transactions or operational things like is your gym look is it clean does it look good are the equipment there just you doing your Correct. business is what keeps people in in the world of e-commerce and direct consumer though there is this massive misconception that once you get a sale you've acquired a customer yeah. And the honest truth is customer loyalty is a complete fallacy. Like nobody cares about your brand, just like nobody cares about you. Like mm. very, very rarely is there this emotional attachment above and beyond reason before you get to multiple purchases. Like maybe if I've spent four or five, six things, like I've got maybe three dozen pieces of Dandy Del Mar clothing and I love them and I'll <laughs> fight to the end of the earth that they're like the greatest thing ever. But like they've also gotten thousands of dollars from me because I bought from them for years, right? Yeah. There's a brand affinity that has built that out based on multiple transactions. So the problem mm -hmm. with LTV divided by CAC is that while it's true, customer acquisition cost, while it's true, it doesn't account for the operational cost of future transactions. And mm. you will see a lot of people say, well, I'm never going to spend money on acquiring a sale from an existing customer. Okay. 
Yeah. What that also probably means is your LTV is lower than it could be. And mm. you are not getting the easiest money. Because let's be fair, getting a second sale is probably way more profitable than a first because that cost of getting that transaction is cheaper. Getting a yep. third sale is cheaper. Um, but if you have to pay multiple times, basically if you have any ad in the world or any organic content in the world that reaches somebody that already spent money on you, well, then you are spending money to acquire those second sales. Like there is a cost that's going into that. And so it's an intellectually dishonest approach to say LTV divided by CAC is a legitimate position. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll close that point with this. You might say, I have an LTV of 125 bucks and my CAC mm -hmm. is 50. I made 75. All right. Let's say instead that yeah. let's give a little bit more nuance to that data point and say, Every transaction in that customer journey to get you to that LTV of 125 costs you 50 bucks and say there's three transactions. Mm -hmm. LTV divided by CAC says, oh, I made two and a half X. When mm -hmm. you add up the cost per transactions, you lost $25 on every customer you acquire. So there's a big gap. So ultimately what I look at is a thing called PSM, profitable scaling margin. And to be fair, this is like a, I didn't come up with the concept. This is something that is, at least decades, if not centuries old. It's basically saying, what is the LTV of a customer on one side of the equation yep. uh, divided by uh, the cost of operations and acquisition times the number of transactions? So for instance, if, it, if costs and co uh, if, if CPA and COGS on average is yep. 50 bucks, like we were talking about before, and let's say the average per the lifetime value is two hundred dollars and the average person buys two and a half times well i know it cost me 125 bucks to acquire 200. now i only need to be day one profitable until that second sale happens because then we look at blended cpa what is the overall blended cost of any transaction when you break down the cost of a transaction down to the unit value then you start yep. to bake into the account of like, well, I'm getting some transactions from emails, from subscription, whatever else. That dramatically lowers your blended CPA, which increases your profit margin with which you can scale into. And so with the LTV by CAC, if you chase that, you'll lose $25. With PSM, you know that like, oh, I can make $75 per person and I no longer become beholden to day one profitability. And so ultimately, that long rant is to say that what I'm looking for more than anything yeah. is establishing that equation. And I look at it by cohort. Like if this is the first product you buy, what is the offer that gets you introduced to the business? Based on that offer, every customer more or less over time is going to round out into kind of fitting to some LTV cohort. Let's figure out the cash flow cycle and mm -hmm. the margin uh, of profit including ops costs and, and, and acquisition for each transaction to see how much money we make. And then from there, we're basically managing to that CPA number, or we keep that CPA number constant and maybe we can improve the LTV. Maybe mm -hmm. we improve the LTV by multiplying the number of purchases in the, in the transaction count, whatever it is. But now we've got multiple variables in the equation that we can address. And so I'm looking at those variables, although COGS is generally not one that I'm as a marketer really looking at because I'm not the guy negotiating with the factory, right? Like <laughs> there are other people better than me at that. Yeah. Now I'm able to say, well, if our CPA is a constant, but I can improve your second purchase rate from 5% to 10, our allowable CPA goes through the roof. If we can nice. improve the LTV because we're getting the AOV of the first transaction higher, our LTV goes through the roof our allowable CPA goes through the roof. Like, so it means that we can, as marketers, look to the metric that we can control, which is CPA, but as growth operators, we can look at the overall business model to understand the monetization of that attention and how do we improve that customer journey. And ultimately, um, the funnel ends at a transaction. Mm -hmm. That first sale, is the least profitable transaction in any customer journey. Hmm. 
Then you have the customer journey with additional transactions. Further yep. down the customer journey, generally speaking, the more profitable the transaction. You can try as you might to get this first sale to be as efficient as possible. Or you can say, I make enough money here to add more to the top. I'm gonna to stabilize my funnel and then work on getting more people to buy a second or a third time. You can try to optimize where you make way more profit. Mm -hmm. Or you can try to optimize the least profitable piece in the journey that ultimately inhibits your ability to access future transactions. Because when you're changing your ads out all the time and using caps and audiences and creative testing constantly, what you're really doing is making the conversion rate optimization efforts of your team basically impossible. Yeah. If the type of customer that comes into my store looks different every single day, the ability for me to optimize to get them to spend the most amount of money is effectively uh, an impossible task. Yeah. So that, those are the kinds of things that I look at, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And what would you say is that, uh, I don't know if there's like one golden metric, but what is that LTV to like AOV bump that a brand should be optimizing for? Like how much of an increase in percentage should somebody try and get from that first transaction to the LTV of that customer? I, I will say this. I will define success, forward momentum success as a double digit change. Now, that does not mean yep. 10, 5% to 15 but if I'm at five and I can get to five and a half, that's a big win. Mm. Like if I can get a double digit change, that means there's an institutional improvement yep. of at least 10% across the board. And what I found is when you get a change of the order of magnitude of that much, as you begin to ramp up the volume of people that flow through your funnel, you are, of course, going to depreciate. Like, odds are you're not going to get as many good people when you try to get more people. But if you get a, if you get a double-digit percentage win, that generally gives you 2 to 3x that percentage in additional volume of customer. So if you get a 10% win, you might get 20 to 30% more customers before you get back down to the same unit economics you had before you had that win. Yeah. And so if I don't get that level of win, I'm going to continue to go. A 5% win is like, cool, nice information. It's a win, but it's not good enough for anybody to take action on. Yeah. And what is that? I've also seen a lot on Twitter, right? Uh, uh, there's, there's Taylor Holiday, who's been talking a lot about like contribution margin and so what's the difference between like your psm versus contribution margin um and and i know twit i know taylor and, and we've talked and we've obviously you know had our uh relationship that's fairly public i will say this i think contribution margin is a valuable metric when you're managing day-to-day -day, managing cash flow on an operational level of like money in money out yeah the problem with contribution margin is it does not take into account cash flow. So hmm. for instance, when I was working at 310 Nutrition and when I got there, we were, they were doing about 15 million a year. When I left 20 months later, they had a hundred million dollar valuation from Deloitte. Hmm. Solid stuff. The makeup of the revenue that we got by the time I left was we were making 40 or 50 K a day from existing customers repeat buyers, subscriptions, whatever, right? Like we really focus on acquiring that cash flow. What we call mailbox money. Walk out to the mailbox in the morning, there's a big check. Awesome. Nice. We spent generally 60 to 75% of that revenue on ads. So if you think about it like this, if I spend, if I make say 40K in reoccurring and I spend 30K on ads, I'm going to make exponentially more money because I'm also trying to acquire more mailbox money. The problem with contribution margin is it forces you to prioritize that initial transaction. And if I know that I can make, if I'm running cost caps and I'm managing to, uh, to contribution margin, I'm going to run the ads where I get the best margin, right? But let's say I have an ad running at 38 bucks and I have an ad running at 48. If that ad at $38 has a customer that ultimately matures to a $45 LTV mm -hmm. and the ad at $48 has a customer that matures to 100, contribution margin would point you in the direction 
of losing over 50% of the revenue per customer. Hmm. And there's a big gap in that logic. And there's a difference between a performance marketer and a growth marketer. And that's where performance marketers in general define success at far lower levels of growth than growth marketers do. And they often say things like, we have a seasonal business, Facebook breaks for them a lot. There are a lot of things built on these non-sustainable activities. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, we are buying... Instead of trying to sell this thing, we're trying to buy a customer where we know how they're going to behave and then mapping our business to that future behavior. Hmm. And that's, I think, the biggest gap. I think it's a valuable metric to understand because you don't want to run out of money. But it's a dishonest metric when you look at the overall business health and when you prioritize growth over day one margin, you can ultimately look at profit volume versus profit margin. And I'll take 10% profit on a million over 10x profit on 100 all day. And those clearly hyperbolic, but I think that's just a difference in opinion. And um, that's, the that's I think, as far as I understand it, uh, the biggest gap. And I, I'd love to talk with Taylor on, on camera and for yeah. us to have a, a great convo to dive into that because maybe I misunderstand it. And if that's the case, I'd love to be set straight. I'd love to improve. I'd love to get better. I'd love for somebody to challenge me and to help me become a better person. <laughs> that, that's that's awesome. Because like one thing I'm, I'm thinking about also is I, I've had a lot and I think that's because of the nature of the way I run my own videos is I do get a lot of drop shippers, a lot of people who watch my videos to make a quick buck, I'd say, mm -hmm. with their e-commerce brand. And when I hear talks about contribution margin, when I hear talks about now PSM, I think long term, I think building a brand, I think years down the line. Is that still applicable to someone who wants to make fast cash with an e-commerce brand who's not looking for an exit or who's not looking to make money then but wants to make money now? Yeah, I think it is. And I think that ultimately comes down to one of the most important questions. Hmm. What is your definition of success? Hmm. If your definition, I, I know this, one of the guys that came through the Facebook ads MBA program a couple of years ago, his name is Daniel. Like he had brands that were live for like three, four months a year. And okay. they were by no means seasonal, but he only ran yeah. them when everything was in his favor and he could make six, seven figures in that time. And he's like, Free and clear the rest of the year. His definition of success was not build was not build a sustainable business. His definition of success is can I make a million this year and then tap out? Which to be fair, great. Mm -hmm. He's a tremendous salesman and he's very successful at what he does. And, and to be fair, that's probably an oversimplification, but just to kind of make it relatable to like the the, the audience here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I know it is a oversimplification, but but, but the point. So it gets down to this point of, if that's your definition of success, one of the reasons Daniel can do that is because he's also very, very good at spinning that up. And he can take mm. the same idea and run it every year over and over again. The problem is, if you make all your money in one shot, anybody can get lucky once. Yeah, Being able to repeat that is very difficult. And I've actually just had a rash of drop shippers, especially when all the cost cap stuff, like more and more drop shippers are joining the MBA program. I, I had like three this week that I've been having conversations with. Nice. Um, and one of the big things that we're talking about is how to become, how to move from a drop shipper with a product to a vertically integrated brand. And that vertically integrated brand can be 100% drop ship white label. But hmm. an example of it is like, say I've got an iPod case right? Uh, not iPod, AirPod case, AirPods, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I say I've got an AirPod case and I'm selling it well. That's my hero dropship product. Awesome. Can I not sell phone cases? What about cables? Hmm. What about laptop cases? If somebody buys this from me, what's another product I could sell them? What if I could drop ship that product? What if I could sell that as a drop shipped product via email? Hmm. 
What if I can find half a dozen or a dozen of them and then run email, Google Shopping, and DPA ads, and all I'm going to do is sell this dropship product, but as soon as it dies, I have a customer base that I can reach out to and basically just hit send and collect checks. True. That builds sustainable cash flow. And the big difference between a lot of these drop shippers that are fly by night success stories that share all of their Black Friday and you know Q1 success stories, and then every single year in February, every one of them says that Facebook is broken. I've seen it 10 years in a row. Yeah. Versus the other folks that are successful, is the folks that are successful know, oh, this is gonna be a harder time. Let me get customers in Q4 and Q1 that are more likely to buy from me again and then work on figuring out the next thing to sell them. Hmm. And I will say this, I legitimately don't, I cannot think of a nine figure business that's built off of a single product. Like even if you look at the Shark Tank success stories of things like Scrub Daddy, well, yeah, one, it's a usable good, so you have to go back and get it, but they have a wide variety. They have a whole product line. Yeah. Like if you buy one, you're probably going to buy other ones and there's packages and there's bundles. There's all sorts of stuff. The point is you can choose to be a salesperson that makes a good commission, which is basically a drop shipping store, or yeah. you can choose to be a business operator. But again, for me to tell you what your definition of success is would be disingenuous of me. Your definition of success might be, I want to make a million bucks and get out. And you know what? Awesome. My nice. argument to you is I think you could do that in a way that also gets you a hundred grand a month after that. And so then mm -hmm. you made a million to get you a million every year. And then you never have to play the game again. And yeah. maybe for you, I have a buddy, Sam, his whole fun thing is he gets a business up to a million and sells it, gets a business up to a million and sells it. His whole, like his juice comes from doing that. And awesome. Zero to one. But he's built a business nice. off of the ability of spinning them up and selling them. So his money's made on the selling them and then ultimately investing in other companies. Um, and so him selling it off, he gets to play the game and then put his money into long money with investing into other various companies. And that's his whole shtick, which is awesome. Yeah. I, I wish I had figured that out when I was 15 years younger. Uh, <laughs> Sam is a, is a G and I'm, I'm I, uh, damn, this just didn't exist when I was, when I was in my mid twenties. Yeah. Just wasn't a thing. I'm, I'm 40. So like, yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't sling stuff on my space. That just wasn't an option. <laughs> but you touched on something also in, in, in that bit where you said like uh, February, you know, every, every one of these guys is out here saying like, ah, you know, Facebook's like dead or, or like it's a hard time. And I think now we're coming out of that season where everyone's been claiming that in the last, I'd say even two months. Um, mm -hmm. especially with the one day that Facebook was also been down in the last month. Like all I see now on Twitter is, is people saying Facebook is harder this year than it's ever been. Um, platforms going down. Anybody else is having troubles with their Facebook ads. What do you say to people who have these kinds of thoughts and comments? Is that true? Is that not? Or why are people feeling that sentiment? Um, I think it's very true for them. And I think, to be fair, misery loves company. There's a much stronger camaraderie and community around struggle. Mm. So psychologically, the folks that are seeing difficulty and reach out about that difficulty are going to find more people in their echo chamber that resonate with that. And more importantly, your social group, especially as entrepreneurs, we all tend to like find other folks that talk like us or think like us. Or for me, I actually try to make friends with everybody who disagrees with me so that like I can level up because like, Help me get better. I, I want to be proven wrong. Give me the data. I teach people all the time. How can I make more people be successful? Like my product is confidence and joy and success. That's what I sell people. And I'm very, very, uh, I have a high hit rate of delivering. Let me put it that way. Nice. Um, yeah. So my point to that is, you know, I got into this thing with this guy, Nabil, over and over again. And he's been saying, everybody I know is struggling. And I, I believe him. I believe that, he has a network of individuals that he was sharing ideas with and hacking the machine and doing the cost caps and everything with, and they all saw the same struggle. They all got to the same pain point and they mm. all learned from more or less the same people. And my critique on that is there are a lot of reasons why this happens every year. 
And I won't necessarily get into all of that. Now, there is a seasonality to the unit economics of attention, right? There are times when consumer intent is higher. There are times when user demand and supply on attention is higher, like Super Bowl. There are fewer people on their phones and more people dropping a lot of money. So CPMs go through the roof, right? Mm. After Amazon Prime Day, consumer intent tanks because Amazon just drained the entire ecosystem. Like there are these knowable experiences throughout the year. What I would say to individuals is if everybody you know is failing, look to the people that aren't and mm. ask them what they're doing differently than you. I look at these struggle points as opportunities to get better. And if your interest in these points of struggle is to find people to join in the struggle with you, mm. that's a lot different than finding people who can help you out. And um, my buddy Curtis that has this company, uh, Portland Leather Goods, and they're like now a nine-figure company. Uh, he, he posted this thing on LinkedIn and, and I don't remember the psychological effect, but basically we have the power to influence people around us. If you have low expectations of people, they will generally meet it. If you have high expectations of people, they will generally meet it. The point of that is if your social circle is everybody listening to the same idea and everybody fails, your, op your chances of getting future failure is really high. Hmm. If your social circle is everybody is successful, and you're listening to what they're doing, and it challenges the way that you think, your likelihood of being successful is high. For so sure. that, that's where I'm coming from. And if everything I tell you to do makes everything wrong for you, find people that completely disagree with me where everything works for them and go listen to them. Uh, but I, I mm. think we have the choice to embrace a victim mentality, or we can look at to quote Game of Thrones, chaos is a ladder. Like, how can I get better when things are difficult? Yeah. That is what separates the most successful people um, from the folks who are pretty good. Love it. It's awesome. On yeah. these uh, fine words of wisdom, is there anything you wanted to cover today that we haven't touched on yet? I mean, there's a million things we could cover. I, I, I mean, I don't want, I don't really have any agenda. I, I will say... Uh, let me, I, I think I teased out something before. And, and so let me really just say, like, um, I got asked this question by uh, yep. the fine folks at, uh, let me pull this up because this is a DM in, in my Twitter here. Hold on a second. <laughs> let's, let's do this. Uh, on the receipts. <laughs> uh, dude, I got it, man. I got it. All right. So this is a request from the fine folks at Chew on This. Okay. All right. Big friends with those guys uh, in a fantasy football league with some of them. Um, and uh, I was not the winner of that league. Actually, Jonathan Snow uh, was from Avenue 25 out of Miami. He's the gangster. He's, he's won two years in a row, and we're all trying to take him down. Anyway, the question was, like, what are you doing to growth hack? Hmm. We've arrived at the mentality that Facebook and acquisition is too high. Mm -hmm. We need to growth hack or, or do we actually need to like, let's challenge yeah. that concept. And if, is it that our acquisition is too high? Is it that our product just isn't as good? If your acquisition too, is too high, where does your retention sit? Mm -hmm. uh, do you look at CAC to LTV? What about other measurements? Um, and before you go into growth hacking, what are some of the fundamentals of business that you look at? Where do you look to improve? Mm -hmm. And basically my response to that, which I think is a very valuable question, is the first thing that I do when I work with businesses mm -hmm. is I do a PSM analysis mm -hmm. by cohort. I want to know what is the cash flow cohort by offer? I think this is essential. In this data, we're always going to find the easiest set of wins. And what that means more than anything is, I don't look at Facebook ads as how do I sell something. I look at all marketing as an investment in growth. Hmm. 
And I think the folks that run their Facebook ads of like, oh, we have this product on our shelf and we can't sell it. Run Facebook ads to it is probably the single worst use case of Facebook ads that I can think of, of something I've been asked to do in the last week. Um, although that's 100% happening. Uh, and we're figuring <laughs> that out. Uh, fun fact with that, what we did was we made a DPA catalog of all the products that are on the shelf and need to be gone. And then we run that as its own catalog to their own audiences with a separate allowable blended CPA of like, if we don't sell this thing now, it will be dead stock. How do we break even? Let's just get rid of it. And uh, that was wildly successful and we're running away with it. So that's, that's how I would solve that problem. Um, nice. That's literally what I'm doing with somebody right now. Uh, a Shark Tank <laughs> business, they make a million a month. That's literally what I'm doing with them right now. Nice. Second, uh, and by the way, I don't know why, but all my Shark Tank businesses of people that I work with and my friends are all Barbara Corcoran deals. I, I haven't gotten a single Mark yeah. Cuban deal, but I got like multiple <laughs> Barbara Corcorans. I don't know why, but shout out to Barbara. A lot of her people Love are my it. people. Fun fact. Second, Love it. I'll try to focus on that cash flow versus the day one metrics. The customer journey is far more stable and projectable than any marketing funnel, right? Like we've seen, oh, the marketing funnel just broke. But generally speaking, the way people behave after they buy your product is far stickier. Their relationship with your business based on the quality, the marketing, the customer journey, the customer service, the offerings, everything that you've done, the DNA of your business model produces very stable outcomes. And that is far more projectable. And so once we can lean on that business model, then we are looking at the funnel as how do we effectively invest some of the profits of our business model into the growth of the opportunity of our business model. But then on days where Facebook is broken today, okay, turn it off. Hmm. Done. Or don't. I don't, even, I don't care. Like, Don't even yeah. run it. I've seen some of the, like, fun fact, I, uh, one of my biggest Black Friday hacks mm -hmm. is turn off your ads. Interesting. Yeah. Why, Why? compete yeah. when people that are far richer than you can lose money? Hmm. If it's a losing battle, don't compete. Like, if you read Sun Tzu's Art of War. Yeah. I mean, you can just get sound bites out of it. Don't fight a battle. You know you're going to lose. If instead of running all of your money on Facebook ads, you spent the previous three months figuring out your offers, loading up your customer base, and doing everything you can to find the highest AOV offers that most heavily index the future cash flow, and then on Black Friday, you just send emails, and then maybe yeah. you do some sort of retargeting effort for people when they come back, a little catalog ad action or something. But I was at the business and we were spending 25, 30K a day. We made a million over Black Friday weekend by turning off ad spend. We saved hmm. roughly a quarter million in ad spend and we made an extra million in profit because we didn't, not only did we not waste money on ads, but the kind of people we brought into the store were the ones most likely to spend more money. Nice. So my point to that is, when you corrupt your marketing funnel by running sales and discounts, you can expect those customers to have a lower AOV, a lower LTV. Price conscious consumers are overwhelmingly price conscious. Price conscious consumers are the least brand loyal. When you give up some of your margin to acquire a customer at a lower cost, it is far less likely that that person will ever pay you full price and far less likely they'll ever pay you again. Mm -hmm. So you're effectively saying, Instead of keeping my money, I want to go buy the worst quality customer that also makes all my CRO efforts, my marketing efforts, my customer service efforts, my refunds and finance department work overtime to deal with a bunch yeah. of trash. Yeah. That's not great. So instead, let's focus on that journey. And that will help us simplify our growth efforts in a way that only reduces wasted spend. Let's centralize around the investment portfolios that make the most sense for us. And that might mean that we've got a low cost offer. 310 Nutrition, for instance, we had a $19 offer that came with a $15 shaker cup and a $10 gift card. That thing, when we launched it, raised the average LTV of a customer from 80 bucks to several hundred. And it raised the average mm -hmm. second purchase rate by 300%. Why? Because even if you didn't like it, 
you already had a shaker cup and a gift card to get you on the way to your next sale. And exactly. that was tremendous. I've also dealt with businesses where like at Under Outfit, one of the things that we did there, which is another brand came into the MBA program at 50 K 18 months later, we're doing a million a week. And I mean, like I, I, I can run these things off of those ones. I think most people publicly know me for like yeah. we did a buy three, get one free. You might be mm. interested in a bra. Okay. Maybe you buy a second comfort shaping bra. But what if we said, if your LTV is say 105 bucks yeah. and instead we raise the price a little bit and sell you buy three, get one free. What if your AOV of your first sale is 120? Well, we raise the LTV of the average customer by over 10%. Remember we're hitting that double digit growth metric we talked yeah. about before. And the people that take a buy three, get one free are far more likely to buy again because they're also mm. psychologically more committed to the business. Remember I talked about Dandy Del Mar. There is a mm -hmm. psychological commitment. Poker players know this is being pot committed. When we focus on the best investment profiles for our business, and mind you, that buy three, get one free was, it took a while to get that second transaction, but we got all the money up front versus the $19 offer the average person bought again in 25 days. So we also had this yeah. super fast cash flow cycle. Like we could even lose money knowing that person would come back. But then you can jumpstart your growth by not investing in things that are effectively and objectively worse for your business. Like if you know one thing gives you a 5% lift and another thing gives you 20 and another thing doubles your money. Every time you take the 5%, you lose 95 cents on every dollar you mm -hmm. spend. That sounds like a bad idea, but that's a contribution margin versus PSM conversation. Mm -hmm. So I find growth is all about securing projectable and future cash flow. Then it's simply reinvesting that profit into the amplification of that opportunity that your customer journey has, right? And generally, that looks like more ad spend. And, how does and then I'll use PSM to figure that, that out. I'm sorry What's to cut that? you off. How, how does one like quantify or calculate that? What tools do they have to their disposal to give them these stats? Is triple well enough? Do they need something else? Or how can e-commerce brand owners get these numbers, right? You talked about understanding a, a given cohort that perhaps will be worth more to them in the future or a cohort that won't um, uh, submit as many you know, tickets or, or returns or whatnot. So where do these stats come from? That's a great question. Um, to be fair, the cheap and easy way of doing it, the cost basically free is you can take your customer list of new customer yep. and your customer list of returning customer and throw it into chat GPT and say, who's on both lists and what did they buy first? Awesome. Mm. Sure. Done. Takes you five seconds. Easy peasy. Now, nice. if you want to get more advanced than that, that'll help you hack second purchase rate. If you want to get more <laughs> advanced than that, Shopify's got data. Uh, if you're using things like Wake Reports, they'll have data. Lifetimely is a really easy one. You don't That's need coming. to know the exact metrics, but an, a lifetime value cohort analysis that's available in lifetime lets you know, oh, okay, I see it's, $80 and then around month two, month three, it goes up to like 95 and by six months, it's 102. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I know roughly I get a bump by this much and this time frame, And then if I go out to this level, this is where it kind of levels off. Great. Which one is best for me? I was dealing mm -hmm. with a business that's an Amazon first business getting to Shopify. They're in, uh, I have a brand accelerator program that I work with like four or five brands at a time. Um, and they're a skincare business. And we looked at all their offers and just said, well, which one has the best improvement? And what we noticed mm -hmm. was their best selling product on Amazon was what they were selling mostly on Facebook. And it had about a 5% lift, which is great. Mm -hmm. Day one to day 90, 5% lift. And it was about 30, 40 bucks. We found another offer that was close to $100. And over yep. six months, that $100 person was generally worth 70 to 80% more with two touch points in that journey. Now, when we started to run ads, we could say, well, that day one thing, we can sell it at like a 5%, 10% profit. Our contribution margin looks amazing. But we're only making 5% profit on that customer over time. Mm -hmm. Whereas that other one, where maybe we break even, blended CPA across what your incremental lift to Amazon looks like an email, we break even on that first sale. Mm -hmm. And then that customer just comes back and gives us $70, $80 over the next six months. So now it's just a, how many people can we get to give us $70 or $80? You want to make an extra hundred grand? Go and get 120 of them. Nice. Or go, go get a hundred, you know, go get a thousand of them, right? Like whatever that number looks like. 
And so then it's simply just a, how much more capital do you have to invest in acquiring more cash flow at a profit? And the fun part of looking at it like that is the higher your volume, the lower the margin needs to be because ultimately what we're looking at is week over week, are we making a higher volume of profit? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is on week one, we were making 10K in profit and on week 12, we were making 100K in profit, do you really care the contribution margin? Mm -hmm. The answer is probably no. Yeah, so th those are, that's, I think, the big point that I'd be looking at and the fundamental shift because the ramification, the actionability of that data is your Facebook ad account looks incredibly simple because your biggest liability to success is volatility in your funnel. So you're not so running pressure a thousand is ads. On that. Yeah, pressure is input on the ad account, essentially. Pressure is more on the back end. The business, you, you, it forces mm -hmm. you to build something stronger, essentially, than just relying so, mu relying so much on building like a strong front end that Facebook only is. Yeah. And, and then you look at overall, my number one objective is, can my overall quality of customer remain more or less constant as I add a mm -hmm. higher volume? And if I lose 5% efficiency, but I gain 20% in volume, I'm making more money, even though my margin mm -hmm. gets worse. And uh, yeah. my buddy Nate, who runs, um, who's a part of Original Grain Watches, a uh, really awesome guy, he makes the great point of saying he pegs himself to his spend target. And maybe he makes less money, but if you pull back spend, not only are you not... Not only are you maybe making the margin you wanted to, but the actual revenue in the business goes way, way down. Mm. And we cannot look at business health as how efficient is the Facebook ad account. Yeah. Because to be fair, that is the least sticky, most volatile piece of the overall funnel and customer journey. So if your objective is to make more money, then figure out the way that you make the most money and then backtrack through that customer journey to the point of sale, and then ultimately stabilize what gets you there because a very stable ad account is one that you can add some budget to. And what I tell people all the time is, if you can add 5% three times a week, that'll double your business every month. That's a 37X growth at the end of the year. And I see people saying, well, I'm not scaling fast enough. I can't do this. I'm like, if you're spending 1,000 a day now and you could be in 12 months spending 37,000 a day and it required an hour a week, what are you doing that's more important? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the highest leverage. Yeah, so find stability, work on your business model, actually have a good business, and then just go get more people that behave similarly to the people that you've already optimized. To me, I have not yet heard a rational argument to avoid doing that unless your business is bad and your whole objective is, can I get as many people as possible to buy from me once? Because I know they'll never buy from me again. Hmm. And then at that yeah. point, it's like you've chosen that as your demarcation of success. And to be fair, a lot of dropshippers are like that. And yeah. it's, it's not a slight. It's just that you're finding something cheaply made or at a price that's good enough for you to upsell to somebody else. And it might be a very well-made product. But like I'm getting yeah. something for 10 and I'm selling to somebody for 30. Yeah. And I'm going to sell it to as many people as possible until they figure out how to do it or enough other people come in that I can't make a profit on that thing, then I'll move on to the next. But that yeah. business is not predicated on projectable growth and cash flow. And if that business were to go on Shark Tank, they would get rejected 100% of the time. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll close this entire thought with one thing. Yeah, I've watched every episode of Shark Tank like five times i'm a dragon's den i'm a fucking I'm, I'm all in on it love it i think the word roas has come out of the mouth of a shark on shark tank the u.s version three times yep. in almost 20 mm. years wow like there's an important thing to understand there like the folks whose job is to be successful don't give a damn about the vanity metric of somebody whose job is to just amplify a good business. Mm. That to That's, me yeah. speaks volumes. It does. It does. If they were I saying, think... what's your contribution margin? What's your MER? What's your ROAS? And they say that all the time. Hey, maybe we should value it, but they never do. True. I think the, 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 
finish this off too, I think on, on, on this same thought, um, to me, at least what I've seen amongst clientele and, and brands that I've worked with is more so ROAS is the only thing they know where to look at to quantify whether or not would it be an agency, a CMO, a media buyer, whoever they end up hiring to be responsible for that side of their business. That's the KPI they judge success on. But now you're opening a whole, I guess, a whole can of worm today where people can, can dive into a whole new word of economics to understand the true KPIs that they should be looking at to define marketing success. Where do you want to you wrap things up by um, saying where can people find out more about sure. this said rabbit hole? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm on social all the time. I'm on every channel. It's at CT The Disruptor. And um, if you want to know more about me, look for Disruptor School. If you can't find me, then you shouldn't trust me. I'm a digital marketer. I have to be visible. So... I've got disruptorschool.com. You go to Amazon. You, uh, you go to, you know, you, if you go to Google, you go to Instagram, you go anywhere, you should find it. But um, it. I challenge you to just look because I also want you to see the feedback of other people. I want you to experience everything. Like if you can't find me, you shouldn't trust me. But it's Disruptor School is the brand. My handle, my founder journey is at CT the Disruptor. And um, if you disagree with me on anything, please come with data and help me get better. I openly embrace folks and I openly challenge those who I disagree with. And it's because I ultimately don't want to take the mentality of a victim. I want to level up constantly. And I think nice. that has made me a very bad employee at ad agencies and a very <laughs> strong marketer and business operator. Cause I basically just found everybody in the room smarter than me. I slammed my you know, fist against the table a thousand times and dug my heels in until I had to accept that I was wrong. And I leveled up over and over and Love over it. again. And I nice. encourage everybody to do the same. Love it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charlie, for coming on. And to everybody watching, I invite you to check out Charlie, which his links will be in the description down below. And have an amazing day. See you in the next video. See you.